Good day ladies and gentlemen, I am Leki Janse van Vieren and a warm welcome to our technical summary video on victimization of workers at the workplace in relation to occupational health and safety. Looking at the contents, we're going to start off with an introduction, looking at why it's important, a little bit of a basics on the, on the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as well as the Consolidated Occupational Health and Safety Directive. All of this you need a good knowledge of if you are to understand the article fully. Then we'll be looking at a quick overview of the article, going into a little bit more detail and then a quick conclusion. All right. Looking at the abbreviations that we use, in the slides, you'll see OHS is Occupational Health and Safety, OHSA is the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the one of 1993, BCEA, Basic, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, and anywhere where it talks about PPE, even inside the consolidated directives, um, those refer to personal protective equipment, not property plant and equipment, as we are used to seeing as auditors and accountants. Let's start off with quickly why this is important. The relevance to auditors, independent reviewers and accountants, remember that the Occupational Health and Safety, the Act, is just another piece of legislation that your clients must comply with. You have to assess compliance with it. You've got to assess the direct or indirect effect that the laws and regulations have on your clients, especially if you're performing an audit or an independent review. You've got to comply with ISRE 2400, or ISA 250 on laws and regulations. What, what you need to do then is if your client does not comply with the relevant laws and regulations, you then have certain reporting obligations in terms of NOCLA. Now you'll see NOCLA, I just gave you a quick overview there. NOCLA stands for non-compliance with laws and regulations. And that could include basically just reporting it to management. It could include qualifying your audit opinion, reporting a reportable irregularity if you're on an audit to ERBA, if you're on an independent review to SIPC, and so on. Then lastly, as an employer, you also need to comply with OHS legislation in your workplace. And the relevance to your clients is basically, as an employer, they have a very strict duty to provide and maintain a working environment that is safe and without risk to the employees. In terms of the basics of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, just a quick background, it requires the employer to provide and maintain a working environment that is safe for everybody. That means that it's to employers, to ensure that it's their employees, as well as anybody that is directly affected by their activities, like customers, clients, contractors, or even their workers who enter the workplace. Right. You've got to ensure as an employer that they are not exposed to hazards to their health and safety. This also applies to self-employed persons, which is what we very often forget and not very, many, not very many people know about this. So in, for instance, plumbers or electricians or any type of consultant where their own working activities bring them into contact with members of the public, that means that the OHSA is also applicable to them. And as an organization, I think the penalties in terms of the OHSA is about 100,000 Rand to an organization per offense. And for, for people in your, your personal capacity, it could be as much as 50,000 Rand. So we're not talking small money. Quickly looking at the consolidated directives that were issued. The initial publication was issued on the 28th of April, 2020. Then it was updated in June last year to bring into effect the concept of vulnerable persons and what happens when somebody refuses to work due to the COVID, the COVID pandemic. All right. So due to the environment not being regarded as safe, whether it was a real or just a perceived um, unsafe area, unsafe um environment for them, they were allowed to refuse work. And the, the directive showed that very briefly. Then it was updated once again in September. And then the last one that was updated was in May this year. And that brought into play mandatory vaccinations. If you don't have any knowledge of this, remember, it's very important that you must have. Please go and have a look at Annexure C. 
Annex C contains all the important info there. All right, relating to what your responsibilities are towards mandatory vaccinations. Whether or not you, if you've got a policy, you've got a whole whack of things that you must have. For instance, um, you have to provide time off to your employees to go for the vaccination. They even suggest in there that you provide transport to the vaccination, to the vaccination site. Um, also, after the vaccination, if your employee feels a bit under the weather or they're suffering from any symptoms, they're allowed to take sick leave and you've got to allow them to take that sick leave. Um, and then, of course, if they're off for longer, let's say they don't have any sick leave left, that you can then ask them, you can then also have them um, perform uh, or take annual leave. If they don't have annual leave, unpaid leave, and you can also then help them to apply for compensation from the compensation fund, right, for this. So the consolidated OHS directive is very important, and we only need to focus on the last one. The vulnerable persons and everything, it was updated, all of them updated every time, so the latest one is version number four. In terms of the article that we're dealing with today, a little bit of an overview, it was issued by the Department of Employment and Labor, so they issued it, and it gives us valuable insight into what they found in practice. The article was written by the head inspector, and worrisome what they found is they said, even though they gave us the directions, which was a comprehensive document on how to prevent the infection and spread of COVID-19, how that must be adhered to by employers, they said that the inspectors found that the compliance is below 60%. Now, whenever the compliance is below 80%, they say that a law completely doesn't work. So that the law and regulation needs to be re-looked at completely. So they are founding, finding it completely um, an issue that compliance even now is still below 60% because it's, it's a long time since the OHS directives came into play. So all if you read between the lines, they don't say this explicitly, but it does imply that the, the inspectors will continue to monitor this in future and that they now know what to focus on. They know that people don't, don't bother with this. So then they will also then possibly issue compliance notices in future, which could then lead to a lot more, um, uh, a lot more penalties being issued. Right. So if we go and look at the article in a little bit more detail now, let me take you through the contents. In terms of the contents here, you'll see over the past 18 months, that's what we've dealt with. All right. So it's been in it's been in play and we need to comply with this. As the inspectors worry about this, they're saying that employers in most sectors are not complying. And even after 18 months, they found that the sad truth is that people are still not complying, even so many months, so many months down the line, like I told you. And remember, below 60 is very, very worrisome. Below 80 means that there's a, it's a sign of a flawed system, is what they call it in the article. So where does this leave us? An employer has a duty to provide and maintain a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of his employees. When I say his, he's her, okay? The employer has to take all necessary measures to make sure that the requirements of the act are complied with by every single person in his employment and every single person entering the premises that he controls. So that means that the responsibility is much wider than just employees. So what is the, what is the duty of employers and self-employed persons to persons other than their employees? Okay, so this is where they talk for the first time, you'll see they imply here self-employed persons as well. So what is this? It's incidentally, it's not a new requirement at all. But they have to go through exactly the same to make sure that nobody is affected by the operations of business in a negative way. So every effort must be made to ensure that the health and safety of people outside the immediate perimeter of the business is also protected and taken into, into consideration. The duty to inform, when they talk about that, they literally talk about every employer has to ensure 
that the employees know what the hazards are in the workplace. They must know what the hazards are and they must know what to do when something happens. So it includes all the precautionary measures that have been taken. All right. So it's very important to note that if somebody has been laid off to work or laid off work, that matter must be taken up with the CCMA and the relevant bargaining councils. There's also a lot of victimization at the moment. All right. Because what happens is the duty to inform, sometimes the employees just are not informed at all. And then they go to a bargaining council or they go to just a, a union or whatever the case may be. Or they get together and they speak to somebody and they say to them, did you know that you must actually do this? And they go, oh no, I never, I never knew. And then what happens sometimes is they will go to the Department of Labor and inform them. And these employees are victimized for that. Okay. In extreme cases, employees have even been warned or fired, right, because um, the cases have raised the matters with supervisors and either they are laughed at or they are humiliated. Okay, ach, you sissy, why do you need a hard hat, you know? So it's, it's really very important that the employees are not victimized because even if they are laughed at or whatever, now what they are having is it's an absolute abuse of power. And it's morally deplorable, okay, so that the, the, they should be able to report to the, to the department for further investigation without any fear of victimization. What are the general, in, general duties of employees at work? In a nutshell, to ensure their own safety as well as the safety of their fellow employees. Now, very important, this is an instruction, it's not a nice to have. So most employers bypass this most basic and important requirement. They forget that as a, as a supervisor or a manager, they've got the same responsibility as the rest of the employees. So they also, in their capacity as, as employees and as other people, they've got to keep their own employees and other people there also safe. All right. Then we're looking at the uh, employee when they have another duty, they've got to, or they're expected to carry out any lawful order that's been given to him or her. In, or, and, and in conjunction with that, they've got to obey the health and safety rules and the procedures that have been laid down by the employer. Where any situation is unsafe or unhealthy and it comes to their attention, they have to report that situation to the employer or to the or, the or the health and safety representative, and the rep will then report it on to the employer. Okay. Now, in an, in a lot of cases, that's where the victimization comes in. And on the next slide, we'll see specifically why victimization is forbidden. So, looking at what it says on the slide, there you'll see it says there: no employer shall dismiss an employee or reduce the rate of remuneration or alter the terms and conditions of his employment to anything that is less favorable to him than he now has, or alter his position relative to other employees to that to his disadvantage. So you can't treat him differently than other employees by now disadvantaging him. By reason or fact, or because he suspects or believes that an employee has given information to the, to the Minister of Labor and uh, Employment and Labor or to any other person charged with that administration, like an OHS inspector. A lot of times when the OHS inspectors come to the premises, then all of a sudden the employees have got somebody to speak to. And that's normally who they vent to, because part and parcel of the OHS inspector's duties is to walk around and interview employees. Do you know what to do if this happens? Do you know what to do if that happens? What are your rights in this? And they find out very quickly when the employees are not informed, which means that the employer has not fulfilled his duty to inform. They also say that an employer cannot and should not victimize an employee who has complied with a lawful prohibition, requirement, request or direction of an inspector. So if the inspector says to him, you need to answer this question, and they do, they can't be victimized for it because they're doing what the act says they should. Right. So it also says there, neither may he or she do so, they, he or she is the employer, 
where the employee has done anything which may or is required in terms of the act. Okay. And they refuse to do anything which is prohibited from doing in terms of the act. So if they refuse to do something within the confines of the law, that's fine. They're allowed. All right. So this is in a nutshell why the victimization is forbidden and how it is forbidden. In closing, remember that the responsibility to comply with occupational health and safety rests solely on the shoulders of the employer first to ensure that every effort is made to comply and to make sure that everybody in his employee, his or her employee complies. They then have the duty to inform and the employees then have their own duties to keep themselves and their fellow employees safe. Lastly, what's important to be able to look at this beast that is occupational health and safety, you need in-depth knowledge and application of the consolidated OHS directive, the latest one. I've given you as part of a, a webinar recording there, which, which, uh, which is available as a webinar on demand, a webinar that I presented on the 28th of July, specifically covering this latest OHS consolidated directive. It's a two-hour webinar, so feel free to go and look at that on the SAAA website. If you, still, if you feel that you still need more detail, remember we've got our monthly newsletter that we've got, right? We've got our technical alerts that are published daily. Please go and follow SAAA on LinkedIn. Don't follow me. My, my profile is like non-existent. So please follow SAAA for the alerts. Then you'll find that there are webinars on demand, right? Not always live. But some of them, most of them are the live events. And those would be the two hour and four hour recordings. We will still have our live webinars, specifically if you guys tell us that, listen, I want a two hour session on this. Right. Or maybe just a one hour session. And then lastly, we've got the MCLU subscription, which means that you can stay up to date. That's what MCLU stands for. Please, for any of these, refer to the SAAA website because all of these webinars will provide you with valuable CPD. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I trust that you enjoyed this technical summary video. Goodbye.